Dust continues to gather on the silent mass of plaster casts piled together in Romano Vio's studio on the Venice Lido. He is no longer with us. He left us silently, in keeping with his character. We make our way among the plaster casts. Some are in fragments. Others seem to be waiting for a loving hand to come and bring them back to life. There are some which modestly conceal a distant, unreal and bewitching beauty. We ask ourselves, is it possible that a sculptor of such calibre must fall into oblivion with the passing of time? That no public body intervenes to bring some order to this confusion? Romano Villa was a very unobtrusive man. Wrapped up in his world of work and family affections, he never bothered about any self-glorification. A veil of sadness comes over us, when faced with the greatest sculptor of the second half of the 20th century, as defined by Clauco Benito Tiozzo, artist, art critic, and also a very good friend. This film, which marks the centenary of the birth of Romano Vio, aims to bring some of his works into the spotlight. Something more than just a tribute to the late master, but rather an incentive to widen critical knowledge of him. We went to meet Professore Tiozzo in his delightful villa in Miraporte along the Brenta Canal just outside Venice. Parlare del caro Romano Vio mi commuove sempre per l'amicizia che ho avuto con lui veramente fraterna e poi per la stima che ho sempre avuto per la bontà dell'uomo, per la interezza dell'uomo, eh, carico di umanità e di amore per l'arte e per gli altri. Ho avuto modo di conoscerlo un giorno quando, chiamato dal barone Lopez nel suo palazzo del Canal Grande, perché durante una cena una candela aveva distrutto una parte di un dipinto di Bernardo Cavallino e gli avevano indicato la mia persona come capace di rifare il pezzo cioè la, la, il pezzo della figura che mancava e lì ho conosciuto Romano Vio che aveva avuto un prestito da parte del barone che era una persona molto squisita e gentile, amante dell'arte, e uno studio proprio a piano terra con delle grandi vetrate. E Romano stava eseguendo tutti quanti i modelli in Creta di un monumento a Umberto Giordano, il grande musicista Umberto Giordano, per Foggia, per la città di Foggia. Si trattava di un, di un gruppo di statue raffiguranti tutte le sue opere con al centro una grande scultura, grande statua di, di Umberto Giordano, del musicista. E erano veramente delle opere stupende che lui modellava con una cura, con una passione, con una bravura anche 
eh, con tanto sentimento nelle figure, mi ricordo la figura di due donne eh, vestite nei costumi settecenteschi, che era una cosa splendida, una cosa splendida. Sono andato a trovarlo diverse volte, da lì è iniziata la nostra amicizia. Ci siamo ritrovati, dopo a distanza di anni, nel 75, all'Accademia, dove anch'io ho ottenuto l'insegnamento e lui insegnava plastica ornamentale. Ecco, e con Romano, era risaldata l'amicizia eh, antica, e siamo diventati quasi fratelli. Romano Villa was born in Venice in 1913 and spent his whole life in his native city. A flat near Campo Santo Stefano was his birthplace. He then lived in the heart of the city next to the famous clock tower in St. Mark's Square. Before finally moving to the Lido, where he continued to model clay in his studio next to the church of San Nicolò until shortly before his death in 1984. The studio still contains and preserves a comfortable disorder of plaster casts, terracottas, small bronzes, sketches, notes, drawings, as well as instruments used by the artist. The plaster cast of the death of St. Benedict, exhibited at the International Exhibition of Sacred Art in Rome in 1950, takes pride of place. The wide drapery of the habit, wrapped around the figure, gives him a sense of imposing dignity, mindful of medieval sculptures. The studio is ideally complemented by the garden, which houses several works, including Girl with a Snail, a sculpture in cement dating from 1968. Here, a naturalistic interest with remote roots in Greek art is accompanied by delicate chiaroscuro sensitivity. Parlare del papà non è, non è facile. Eh, posso dire quello che già un po' conoscono tutti, che il papà era una persona molto riservata, molto umile e parlava anche molto poco del suo lavoro. Eh, coinvolgendo, coinvolgendo al minimo diciamo, la famiglia. Perché questo? Perché perché lui eh, aveva questo pensiero eh, riguardo all'arte. Diceva che l'arte è sofferenza perché eh, fare l'artista non è semplice, è una cosa molto eh, impegnativa, molto difficile. Facile è fare delle cose brutte, ma è difficile fare il bello. Per ricavare eh, un prodotto artistico eh, che abbia eh, una certa validità eh, ci, vuole, ci vuole impegno, ci vuole costanza, ci vuole molto lavoro. Dunque l'opera che il papà apprezzava di più era il San Benedetto, la morte di San Benedetto, un'opera che è sempre rimasta in gesso e non è mai stata fusa in bronzo. Tanto è vero che una volta è uscito con questa espressione, non mi sembra neanche di averla fatta io. Romano Vio's first interest in art came as a boy, and his learning was rooted in the artistic environment and the cultural tradition of Venice where he studied. He was a pupil of Umberto Baglioni at the Academy of Fine Arts, where he graduated in 1936. Five years later, he was appointed assistant firstly to Baglioni and then in 1946 to Venanzo Crocetti. Subsequently, from 1956 to 1981, he taught model decoration while continuing his sculptural work, which brought him important recognition, including membership in 1961 of the Accademia Nazionale di San Luca in Rome. Romano Vio's artistic career 
began before he completed his studies. In 1935, he was awarded the gold medal at the National Exhibition for Artists and Graduates in Genoa, with his relief entitled A Mother's Dream, subsequently purchased by Venice City Council. The exhibition of some of his works at the 19th and 20th Venice Biennale and a prestigious first prize in sculpture in 1939 for the Fadiga competition, with a work entitled Goose Step, marked his unmistakable arrival on the art scene. These works, dating from the 30s, show a strong sculptural quality and a didactic clearness of composition which mirror the artistic taste of the time. However, some details highlight both a naturalistic and idealised striving which echoes back to 15th century sculpture and lessens the rhetoric associated with the depicted theme. service, followed by the outbreak of the Second World War, temporarily interrupted his work as a sculptor, but not his love of art. The pastoral environment and civilization of Sardinia, where he was stationed during the war, inspired numerous drawings. These impressions, which remained firmly stamped on the artist's mind and soul, would be returned to later and sculpturally worked into a group of small bronzes depicting sinewy goats, shepherds wrapped in their cloaks, and the lively scene of the milking of a goat. Da quel lontano, forse era il 1955, è perdurata. Ma abbiamo sempre conservato questa amicizia e anche questa, questo modo di pensare l'arte senza mai ripudiare, ripudiare la bella forma, poiché l'arte per noi era qualcosa di bello non di brutto, giusto il concetto di Leonardo da Vinci che diceva che l'arte è scienza, sì, e scientia, anzi, ma è figlia della natura. After the war, Romano Vio returned to Venice and for a period of time worked in the silence of his studio, devoting himself above all to portraits of friends and family members and to religious themes. At the same time, he pondered the changes afoot in society and the academic environment, changing tastes and the affirmation of new artists with their informal trends, all quite different from the aesthetic concept of his figurative world. The 50s again saw him immersed in fervid creativity. His works were displayed at important national and international exhibitions, the Venice Biennale, the Rome Quadriennale, the Turin Quadriennale, and exhibitions of sacred art in Rome, Bologna, and the Pro Civitate Cristiana in Assisi, where he won first prize in 1955 for his bronze relief entitled Jesus the Worker. In his works, the sculptor combines modeling skill with a continual striving for and experimentation with formal stylistic solutions. These demonstrate his intellectual curiosity with respect to art of varying periods and a coherent commitment to finding the most suitable sculptural solutions to affirm his ideal beauty of form without falling into repetition. 
In the life-size bronze statue Dana, exhibited at the Turin Quadriennale in 1953, the sculptor extols the harmony of the slender feminine form. Vibrant light makes the figure pulsate with life, her beauty rediscovered through the harmonious, discrete emergence of the female anatomy from the triangular surface of the dress. Note the interesting position of the model's arms. Raised in a natural everyday gesture, they form another triangle, projecting into the depth of space, underlining the fact that this approach to sculpture is based on calculated rhythms of composition. This generates the sense of the absolute yet mobile formal equilibrium that Romano Rio strived after, showing himself to be in tune with all manifestations of nature in the various guises of perceptible reality. Another bronze entitled Simoneta, modelled three years later and exhibited at the 1956 Venice Biennale, is a female figure that looks at the observer with a detached and at the same time questioning expression. The face, constructed with wide surfaces illuminated by the light and topped by a mass of hair with strong chiaroscuro effects, emerges from a compact block which encloses the image. She seems to be isolated from the world and suspended in a timeless dimension. The contrast between the closed grandeur with origins in the past and the uneven surfaces with their modern sensitivity creates a dynamic and dramatic play of light and shadows and gives rise to a disquieting but yet balanced synthesis of expression. His skill as a sculptor and his deep humanity when relating to his models enabled the artist to produce unforgettable portraits for example, Head of a Man, exhibited at the Sixth Rome Quadriennale. The close attention to physical features in the bronze reveals a strong realism which is in no way inferior to ancient Roman portraits. A serene, refined elegance characterises other non-commissioned works, undertaken simply as a personal study of the relationship between space, volume and light. The 1956 bronze depicting the beautiful lady, sitting in an armchair and focused on her sewing, is invested with an intense luminosity which enhances the figure's grace. Lei mi chiede un giudizio generale su mio padre con il quale ho avuto la fortuna di eh, essergli abbastanza vicino perché aveva lo studio proprio accanto a casa mia. Sta di fatto che ogni tanto lo si andava a trovare e si parlava in generale del passato, presente, come era l'arte, eccetera. E mio padre spesso accennava al fatto che nel dopoguerra c'è stata questa fondamentale eh, fondamentale cambiamento nelle arti e per lui è stato un momento di decisione, una decisione che per lui è stata fondamentale e coraggiosa. La sua insuperabile maestria era indiscussa, la sua tecnica era indubbia e i contenuti delle sue opere avevano un pathos e una poesia ed ebbe la sapienza di rimanere e di rinnovare la tradizione in un secolo difficile e contraddittorio come il nostro. Questi fatti quasi sempre non sono stati capiti da una critica venduta al commercio delle arti, che arti poi non sono. La critica lo definisce, alcuna critica la definisce il più grande maestro dell'ultimo novecento, non è soltanto il Chiozzo, ma anche il Perocco ebbe a dire che era il più grande scultore degli ultimi cento anni. Di conseguenza, ripeto, mio fratello soprattutto ed io stiamo lavorando per poter raccogliere le sue opere in un museo che 
possono essere, possono essere conservate dopo di noi in un ambiente che le riunisce tutte assieme, che le salvi e le salvaguardi. In 1955, he was responsible for the commemorative relief with the portraits of the three Belfiore martyrs, displayed on the post office wall in Venice. He won the City of Savona competition marking 10 years since the end of the resistance, with a bronze relief dedicated to the fallen partisans. This historical synthesis, built around groups of figures on differing levels, recalls the Carbonari conspiracy the heroism of the soldiers in the Second World War, the extermination in the German concentration camps, and the people's bloody fight against the invaders. Subsequently, the artist sculpted the monument dedicated to Giuseppe Marchetti, the youngest of Garibaldi's heroes. This sculpture, inaugurated in Chioggia in 1963, demonstrates a narrative freshness devoid of any rhetorical conventions. Giuseppe De Logo, the art historian and principal of the Academy of Fine Arts in Venice in the 60s, had this to say about this work. Romano Vio's talent is surpassed only by his modesty. In 1964, Romano Vio completed the monument to the fallen in Arqua Polesine. At the beginning of the 70s, Romano Vio was commissioned to sculpt a large-scale, powerful commemorative monument dedicated to Franco Marinotti in Tor Viscosa. The work consists of a large cube, three and a half meters high, in our resina stone. On the front, Franco Marinotti stands among his workers and extends his hand to one of them, his features clearly distinguishable in the profile portrayal of his face. This is Antonio Canova's statue of George Washington, a statue which Romano Vio reproduced in the Plastercast Museum in Pusano in the province of Treviso. Canova's original statue was destroyed in a fire, and Romano Vio was the only sculptor with the skill and ability to be able to reproduce this statue from the plaster original. Sculpted in Carrara marble, it now stands in the state capital of Raleigh in North Carolina. Romano Vio's ability to figuratively interpret themes taken from literary sources, in particular from the Divine Comedy, reaches an all-embracing expressive force in the bronze entitled To Overcome Fraud which was exhibited in 1978 at the International Biennale for Small Bronzes in Ravenna. Here the artist demonstrates creative freedom, yet shows respect for the original text.
Taking inspiration from verses in the 16th canto of Hell, the sculptor depicts Virgil in the act of throwing into the depths the knotted cord, representing the law, which Dante wore around his waist. The great poet is tellingly depicted with outstretched arms to express all his troubled amazement when faced with the frightful monster that is the symbol of fraud, to which the elusive gesture of the hand shrewdly refers. The image of Gerion towers over the two visitors and arrogantly dominates the scene. The face and the ample human bust are modelled with a strong sculptural quality complete with expressionist tones. This is accompanied by a taste of the grotesque in the lower part of the body, which has the form of a serpent with a forked scorpion's tail, just as Dante described. Sacred art has always occupied an important place in Romano Vio's wealth of works. Statues of saints are modelled with skill of portraiture, psychological perspicacity and expressive freedom, the result of personal religious reflection, accompanied by respect for the Christian iconographical tradition. According to the artist, their image cannot be confined within a stylized idealization of the sacred, because when depicting saints, one cannot separate their spirituality from their human personality. Bearing this in mind, consider three bronzes from the artist's final years. The statue of Saint Anthony in the church of Saint Mark in Miraporte, warmly human in his imposing stance the statue of Padre Pio in the church in Maratea, with his spirited expression and a hand raised in blessing, and Saint Francis in the church of San Nicolò on the Lido, mystically absorbed in concentration as he carries a stone to repair the house of God. Romano Vio also produced other types of liturgical ornaments. For example, the Good Friday altar frontal and the Paschal candlestick for the Church of Sant'Ignazio on the Lido. Many other works have won prizes in exhibitions and in national and international competitions, thanks to his ability to effectively combine art and faith. When faced with religious themes, there was a constant commitment to formal experimentation which led the sculptor to develop different techniques and styles to express his spiritual draw towards the divine. In his flight into Egypt, exhibited in Bologna in 1960 at the Antoniano Biennale, the frontal depiction of Mary and the lengthening of the figures hark back to iconographical models common in the Gothic period, even in paintings. The bronze entitled Our Standard, dating from the end of the same decade, has a symbolically significant vertical composition, whereby the artist highlights to great effect the distance separating Christ from man today. The people at the foot of the cross, rendered with expressionist deformity in their isolation, are turning their backs on Christ. A theme that was especially dear to the sculptor concerns the Stations of the Cross, where he expressed Christian religious belief with personal conviction. The panels in the Church of St. Mark in Miraporte, modelled in 1980, constitute one of the last works he finished and denote his greatest achievement on this theme. 
The panels are characterised by the essential nature of the story. Put together with a limited number of figures, modelled in the foreground with a high level of relief that gradually decreases to a stiacciato relief in the background. Other characteristics include the treatment of the rough and diversely modulated surfaces to obtain different suggestive chiaroscuro effects, and the rationally controlled dramatic quality of the scenes, which spiritually draws the observer into the story of the Passion. Bronze inspired by the Canticle of Creatures by St. Francis is also of importance. Most High, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honour, and all blessing. To you alone, Most High, do they belong, and no human being is worthy to pronounce your name. Praised be you, my Lord, through all that you have made and first my Lord Brother Son, who brings the day and light you gave us through him. How beautiful he is, how radiant in all his splendour, of you most high he bears the likeness. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister, moon and stars. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother wind. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister water, so useful, humble, precious and pure. Praised be you, my Lord, through Brother Fire. Praised be you, my Lord, through our sister Mother Earth. Praised be you, my Lord, through our corporal sister Death. Arturo Martini appartiene al primo novecento ed è legato a una cultura poi di, un po' diversa. Ecco, se, se si può fare un raffronto, si può dire che ambedue avevano una grande capacità di modellare. Ecco, ma mentre Martini era un ricercatore, che un bel momento esaurite le sue ricerche, poi non, cre non credeva neanche più, nell'arte scultoria, tant'è vero che ha scritto un libro, la scultura Lingua Morta, e si è messo a dipingere, negli ultimi anni dipingeva. E... Mentre Romano Vio ha sempre portato avanti il suo discorso con una continuità e con una fedeltà enorme. Direi che sono due grandi personaggi, uno che però aveva un carattere che era Arturo Martini, che poi Martini era più irruento, più irruento, più nervoso nel, nella modellazione. E Romano Vio invece era, era un tipo serafico, eh, accarezzava le cose e le, e le portava avanti con, con grande abilità, ma con tanto più amore. Ecco, Martini ha smesso, si è messo a dipingere, faceva dei dipinti che non erano certo all'altezza, era uno sperimentatore, indubbiamente sono due grandi artisti per me, due grandi artisti, uno più irrequieto, un temperamento, anche gli artisti hanno un temperamento, c'è il gaudente, c'è il collo. Ecco, Romano Vio era un mistico quasi. E questo suo misticismo l'ha trasme trasmesso all'arte con una serietà, con una continuità che in Martini non c'è stata. Però siamo anche a, a te in tempi diversi, non, non si può fare un raffronto. Martini fa parte del primo novecento e Romano Vio fa parte del secondo novecento. Quindi la situazione storica, politica è cambiata. Lei mi ha chiesto come artista cosa ne penso. E io l'ho chiesto ai suoi allievi, a Piovan, che è stato un allievo, mi ha detto aveva delle mani meravigliose. 
una capacità di modellare. Quindi ci si trovava a, delle, a dei pranzi alla valigia. Pranzi e, e dove era presente, assieme ai pittori, anche lo scultore Scarpabolla. Scarpabolla, che era il maggior considerato prima del, della fine della guerra, il maggior scultore veneziano, un tipo però molto effervescente, e io colsi l'occasione di chiedergli, ah beh, tu sei indubbiamente considerato il maggiore fra gli artisti veneziani, perché c'è una differenza, lui dirideva, tutti gli altri erano dei dilettanti, no? E, e dico, cosa ne pensi di Romano Vio? Stette zitto un po', si fece serio e poi mi disse, era migliore di me, più bravo di me. E indubbiamente Romano Vio è il maggiore scultore della seconda metà del Novecento, in modo assoluto, per abilità, ma anche per poesia, per capacità espressiva, per profondità proprio nella espressione plastica e nell'amore che lui riversava nelle opere che stava eseguendo. La spiritualità interna che lui sentiva la trasmessa, la, la trasmessa nelle opere, nelle opere, il suo amore per le cose, ma anche non solo nell'arte sacra, ma anche nell'arte profana. Io sono andato a Foggia a vedere quel monumento a Umberto Giordano. Insomma, ci sono quelle, le immagini delle opere principali di, da Giordano con queste figure che sono palpitanti di vita, ma una vita vista con amore. E l'amore è la caratteristica principale della fede cristiana. Romano Vio's most famous work, The Monument to Umberto Giordano in Foggia, dates from the second half of the 50s when he won the national competition held by the city to honor its famous musician. An extensive, dramatically sculptural monument expands to fill the open space. It consists of the statue of Umberto Giordano standing in the centre, and of seven single or multiple figures placed around him, depicting seven of his operas, that is to say Mese Mariano, Marcella, Andrea Chenier, Siberia, Il Re, Fedora, La Cena delle Beffe. Umberto Giordano's music is treated with great sensitivity, and the text of the libretti, often based on tragic stories of love and death, with intelligent respect. In this way, the sculptor was able to use different expressive tones, and to set the individual stories in their correct periods, with great care being taken over details such as clothing, the 18th century garments of the poet Andrea Chenier, 
on his way to the guillotine with Madalena. Or the 19th century protagonists of Siberia. He uses an original and dynamic solution to depict the comic opera Il Re, where the elements commonly associated with the power of the sovereign are worn by an empty mannequin. The actual king is shown as an ugly old man underneath the cloak, trying in vain to catch the attention of the young girl who flees horrified by that unexpected image of reality. It is far from easy to find one definition to sum up the work undertaken over the whole of Romano Villa's life. He was a very skilled sculptor, a member of the Accademia di San Luca in Rome. He was awarded the Military Cross and in 1982 he was made a Knight of the Republic. His artistic career spans a long period, from the mid-30s to the beginning of the 80s, during which he worked patiently to constantly refine his means of expression and his techniques, which he used with great mastery, and which still today, a hundred years after his birth, show him to be one of the greatest sculptors of the 20th century. Tiziano era uno che oltre all'arte sapeva anche vendere, sapeva far fruttare eh, economicamente e sue cose. Però di Tiziano, che pure ha raggiunto delle vette per bellezza pittorica veramente grandi, inarrivabili, ma anche tanti dipinti che sono molto scadenti, tant'è vero che dentro nei depositi delle gallerie accademia ci sono una decina di, di, di opere di Tiziano che non vengono esposte perché sono mediocrissimi del Tintoretto sono tutti capolavori e, e perché Tintoretto aveva un animo diverso, non aveva la dote del commercio, la dote del saper guadagnare, ma aveva l'ispirazione, ha avuto una costante ispirazione, costante amore per l'arte e per le cose e direi che la figura di Romano Vio si avvicina molto a quella del Tintoretto.